This is the second part of the discussion with Dr. Tom Fredrickson. For the first part of the interview, focused on five key steps to identifying and addressing patient conditions that pose a greater risk of respiratory depression, please go to the URL listed on the slide or to the PPAHS YouTube channel. And this program is generously supported by Medtronic and EarlySense. As a global leader in medical technology, services, and solutions, Medtronic improves the health and lives of millions of people every year. Our second sponsor is EarlySense. They deliver continuous monitoring solutions designed to enhance proactive patient care for non-ICU general care patients. I'd like to focus on the monitoring issues associated with caring for patients at risk for respiratory depression. We know that use of opioids is commonplace in healthcare, and we can get complacent about their use. What are the potential adverse effects of opioids? Well, we've already talked a lot about the most important one, which is sedation and the related respiratory depression, but there are many, and uh, they can be um, anywhere from bothersome to serious. Um, and certainly, um, if you're the patient, they're, you know, at best bothersome. They include nausea, vomiting, constipation, um, hypotension, um, and then very common, particularly in the elderly population, delirium. Um, all these are uh, potential complications and, and need uh, monitoring and intervention strategies. I know I've seen all of those as a nurse taking care of patients and typically what happens is once they experience those side effects, their provider changes the medication and looks for something that's going to be more easily tolerated. Uh, what are the peak effects of parenteral opioids and oral opioids? So parenteral opioids usually have their peak effect uh, pretty quickly, uh, within 30 minutes, typically 15 to 30 minutes. Um, oral opioids tend to be a little longer, usually about an hour. Of course, that has implications for monitoring sedation. Uh, we talked before about how often the kind of monitoring regimen involves, you know, hour-to-hour -hour checks. So when you have your peak effect within 30 minutes, that needs to be kept in mind. I know that in healthcare we have almost an automatic reaction that when a patient is receiving opioids that they should receive some supplemental use of oxygen. What is the the connection between the risks associated with giving oxygen to people who are receiving opioids? Well, it has to do with a recognition that for opioid-induced respiratory failure, a decrease in the oxygen saturation is a late marker rather than an early warning sign. So if you're monitoring oxygen saturations as a strategy to detect respiratory failure early, you have to understand that it's not an early warning sign. In fact, it's a, it's a late sign. So if you add uh, supplemental oxygen, it delays that uh, effect even further. So they could be in respiratory failure in terms of uh, starting to accumulate um, carbon dioxide or decrease the of ventilation, um, but the oxygen saturations remain stable for a longer period of time because of the uh, supplemental oxygen, thus delaying recognition of impending respiratory failure. Could you get into the physiology for us a little bit more and describe how opioids depress respirations? Certainly. It, it's a central nervous system effect. And the basic um, mechanism is it decreases minute ventilation, and it does this in a couple of different ways. It decreases the respiratory rate, uh, but it also decreases uh, the tidal volume or the amount of air exchanged during each respiration. And kind of a late effect is it can even affect the rhythm, kind of disrupting the regular rhythm that we're used to and replacing it with a more irregular rhythm. I know that some facilities have looked very carefully at the issue of using pulse oximetry on all of their patients who are receiving opioids. Is that a strategy that would be sufficient to detect respiratory depression? Well, that depends on the situation. Certainly, it, it can be a good strategy. There's a couple things to keep in mind. 
Uh, the first is that there have been studies that have shown that uh, continuous pulse oximetry as part of a comprehensive monitoring program uh, that includes uh, uh, monitoring of vital signs and nurse monitoring of sedation has decreased uh, the um, rate of unexpected transfers to the ICU or decreased the need for rescue medications. But it's important to keep in mind that those are parts of a comprehensive strategy. It's not simply continuous pulse oximetry. And it is continuous pulse oximetry. It's not intermittent pulse oximetry. There are a number of limitations, even though it can be an effective strategy. Uh, certainly the limitation that we just talked about, decreased oxygen saturation tends to be a late marker of respiratory failure, not an early marker. In addition, there's this whole um, issue of alarm fatigue. Um, studies have shown that about one-third, when pulse oximetry is deployed correctly, only about one-third of the alarms are true alarms, so it's two-thirds kind of false positive or false alarms kind of contributing to this um, environment of alarm fatigue that our nurses are in all the time. So while it can be a good strategy, I think for some patients it's not sufficient. Perhaps for the most high-risk patients it's, it may not be sufficient. And I know that facilities have also looked at the use of capnography as an alternative. What are the benefits of that technology and are there limitations associated with capnography? Well, there's always limitations, but there certainly are some benefits to capnography. Um, one benefit is for the highest risk patients, the patients with sleep apnea, for example, uh, the patients in the morbid obesity category who have the undiagnosed sleep apnea or new diagnosis of sleep apnea, those patients on PCA pumps. Um, so for some of these high-risk patients, there's a potential benefit. And the benefits are really derived because it gets at um, more of the early warning signs of respiratory depression and respiratory failure. It uh, approximates that minute ventilation that we talked about by uh, looking at the uh, approximation of end tidal CO2 and, and kind of continuously monitoring uh, the respiratory rate. So it does give you a little bit of an insight, uh, more of an insight than pulse oximetry would to um, what's happening in terms of early warning for impending respiratory failure. Now, having said that, there are some downsides. Uh, I mean, probably the biggest downside is it really hasn't been thoroughly studied in randomized controlled trials. There's been trials of, of lesser uh, strength and a lesser rigor that have shown some uh, advantages to, uh, to capnography monitoring. Capnography monitoring also tends to be uh, somewhat uncomfortable for patients. And lastly, this whole idea of where you set the alarms can be difficult, and that's particularly so in, with capnography. When they look at uh, trends, trends in end tidal CO2 uh, tend to be much more important than absolute numbers, and that's uh, harder to monitor a trend than it is an absolute number. Mm -hmm. I know that in healthcare, the tradition used to be that all surgery was done in the hospital and then surgery started moving into the outpatient setting, including freestanding surgery centers as well as physician offices. There are patients who ask their physicians, why do I need an anesthesiologist if you're doing this procedure in your office? What are the recommendations for surgeries that are performed in physician offices? Well, certainly if deep sedation or even conscious sedation is being used, the recommendations are the same as for ambulatory surgery centers, which includes um, anesthesiologist uh, monitoring and interventions if needed. And there's good reason for that. Even for a minor surgery, if uh, you're undergoing uh, heavy sedation or conscious sedation, there are associated risks, and the anesthesiologist is the expert at monitoring and mitigating those risks, whether that be um, protecting your airway, whether that be recovery uh, from the untoward effects of anesthesia or opioid medications. Um, certainly the anesthesiologist is the expert in knowing when it's safe to discharge from the center that's performing the surgery. So really for all those reasons, um, it's a good idea to have the expert there and involved in your care if you're undergoing sedation. I know that you just mentioned that it's difficult to monitor trends 
And I think it would help our listeners if you could identify if there are any generally accepted thresholds at which point a provider should become alarmed about a patient. Certainly there are, and, and they're published, and there's not necessarily a lot of uh, agreement, but there certainly is some. When it comes to impending respiratory depression, probably the things that need to be monitored are respiratory rate. Um, low respiratory rate, certainly anything lower than 8 uh, it would be considered a warning sign. And the same thing with oxygen saturation. Any oxygen saturation less than 90% would be considered a warning sign. But remember that oxygen saturation, especially in the setting of supplemental oxygen, is a late indicator rather than an early indicator. Um, for other types of um, medical insults, there's lots of other things that need to be monitored. For example, vital signs, including blood pressure, heart rate, and uh, usually kind of the accepted parameters that uh, clinicians would be used to. And I'd like to finish this program by focusing on unexpected hospital deaths, a phrase that puts a chill into every healthcare provider's body to think about people who are not expected to die during that admission. It seems the more that we can learn about the symptoms and signs that lead up to those deaths, the more we can intervene. I know your report talked about three clinical patterns of unexpected hospital death, and I know our listeners would want to know about these three types so that they could recognize the patterns and intervene before an unexpected hospital death. Could you share with us what your studies revealed and what your report shared in terms of each type of those unexpected hospital deaths and how providers can intervene. Absolutely. So we talk about three different types of respiratory failure that can lead to unexpected hospital death. But it's important as we talk about these three types to understand that they're not necessarily discrete and there can be a lot of overlap and an individual patient can um, have more than one type at any given time. It's also important to recognize that since the topic is opioids and how opioids can play a role in these types of deaths, while um, central to type 2 uh, respiratory failure, which we'll talk about in a minute, it can play a role in all three types. So the first is type 1, and that's the type that, as a hospitalist, um, I often need to be very aware of, and that has to do with um, tissue injury. It has to do with an insult to the body. Um, this could be trauma, congestive heart failure, sepsis, pulmonary embolism. Um, any of those uh, types of uh, medical or, or trauma type insults that cause tissue injury because the resulting underlying um, physiologic disturbance tends to be metabolic acidosis. So what we see when we monitor vital signs and so on is um, an increased respiratory rate, uh, tachypnea, uh, and that's really a compensatory mechanism in these folks with the type 1 uh, potential respiratory failure. The way these patients can get into trouble is worsening of their clinical situation. At some point, the underlying metabolic acidosis takes over, and the patient is unable to compensate, and respiratory failure ensues. What clinicians need to be aware of is the tachypnic patient, when the respiratory rate slows down, it certainly could be because the physiologic disturbance has improved, but it also could be that the patient's losing the ability to compensate, and that could be a sign of impending respiratory failure. Type 2 is um, really mitigated by uh, medications, the medications we've been talking about, opioids, but also other uh, respiratory sedating medications. This tends to be uh, associated with uh, a lower respiratory rate, decreased minute ventilation, and a slow increase in end tidal CO2. This can happen over a fairly short period of time, 15 minutes, but it can also happen over hours. Uh, what happens is eventually, as the end tidal CO2 or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide increases, um, and the patient's ability to compensate, again, is lost. Respiratory uh, arrest ensues, and that's what causes the patient's death. 
Type 3, uh, the prototype for type 3 is sleep apnea, and this is that patient who is arousal dependent uh, to keep his respiratory mechanisms uh, in place. So the patient with sleep apnea has this cycle of uh, frequent arousals, and physiologically he or she is dependent upon these arousals to keep breathing. When you um, add a sedating medication such as an opioid into that mix, uh, the patient's ability to depend on arousal and to keep uh, the respiratory mechanisms in place is impaired, and that's when um, Partial pressure of carbon dioxide continues to go up, oxygen saturations precipitously fall, and this patient, uh, from the period of time when they no longer uh, arouse themselves, when they no longer wake up to respiratory failure, can, is literally just a matter of minutes. So those are the three types, but again, keep in mind that uh, opioids certainly can play a part in all three and that there are overlapping uh, mechanisms of action. Well, thank you, Tom. This has been wonderful information for our listeners. I've been speaking with Tom Fredrickson, who's the medical director for hospital medicine at CHI Health and the lead author of a publication that came out in 2015 called Reducing Adverse Drug Events Related to Opioids. If our listeners wanted to be able to access a copy of that publication, where would they go, Tom? They can go to the Society of Hospital Medicine website, and uh, they can download it for free. Oh, um, It's under the Quality Improvement section. Great. Well, I appreciate that information, and thank you for sharing your expertise with our listeners. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. And this program is generously supported by Medtronic and EarlySense. As a global leader in medical technology, services, and solutions, Medtronic improves the health and lives of millions of people every year. Medtronic believes its deep clinical, therapeutic, and economic expertise can help address the complex challenges such as rising costs, aging populations, and the burden of chronic disease faced by families and healthcare systems today. But Medtronic can't do it alone. That's why Medtronic is committed to partnering in new ways and developing powerful solutions that deliver better patient outcomes. Our second sponsor is EarlySense. They deliver continuous monitoring solutions designed to enhance proactive patient care for non-ICU general care patients. The EarlySense system provides continuous and contact-free monitoring of heart rate, respiratory rate, and motion for early detection of patient deterioration, fall prevention, and pressure ulcer prevention. 